Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar sponsored by SCORE Fairfield County. My name is Steve Smith, and I'll be your host today. Uh, the subject we're going to talk about today, as you know because uh, you signed on online, is the key financial metrics for selected industries and how does your business compare. Our presenter is infamous at SCORE. It's John Harmon, who's uh, presented, actually this is his fourth webinar presentation. He is also the chapter chair, and more about him in just a second. First, a little blast on SCORE itself. Many of you know this, so just bear with me a bit. Uh, we were founded in the mid-60s by the Small Business Administration. There are about 320 offices throughout the United States and uh, over 10,000 uh, volunteers. In SCORE, Fairfield County, uh, which is located in Norwalk on East Avenue, we have approximately 100 volunteers with various expertise in industry, process, and subjects uh, like IT, social media, and very spe specific things like that. We uh, offer three primary value-added services. One is our workshop slash webinar program that you're a part of today. We do approximately 150 workshops around Fairfield County. Primarily, the venue is local libraries. You can find the upcoming schedule for those workshops on scorefairfieldcounty.org. Uh, we also have the webinar program that you're on today. Uh, effective now, actually, we're going to two workshops um, two webinars per month, two webinars per month, and this is the second one we've had uh, in, sep in September. Uh, we'll continue to do two webinars per month for uh, the foreseeable future. Another thing on webinars is we, as some of you know, we've been having some trouble getting them up on scorefairfieldcounty.org for viewing after the event, and I'm happy to say that uh, as of today, we do have the capability to show all of our webinars going back to January of 2016. So we're, if you can uh, just give me one second here, make sure we're okay on the, on the technology. Okay, so um, now our next webinar is October 11th. And Cliff Enico, another legend in his own time with SCORE, is going to present something that I know is on everybody's mind, and that is the legal issues related to social media. Cliff is a frequent SCORE workshop presenter, and many of you have heard him both in webinars and on, in workshops uh, in the past. Um, let me just also say that as it relates to this workshop, the webinar uh, will stop sharply at 1 o'clock. The conference is being recorded, and the link to the recording and the slides and the verbiage will all be available at scorefairfieldcounty.org within the next couple of days. Uh, we've set aside time uh, for Q&A at the end of the, John's presentation, and if you've got a question, please use the chat window down on the lower left of your screen, type them in there, and I will kind of moderate that when we get to the end. So now, uh, a little bit more about John. John is a SCORE volunteer and has been our director for the last two years. He's actually passing over the reins to another gentleman and I guess at the end of this week. So we want to just thank you for all of your, your great uh, support and leadership, John, uh, here at SCORE Fairfield County. He's also Managing Director of Agilent Consulting Services that advises small and medium-sized businesses on strategies for growth and operational excellence. John's held senior leadership and executive positions in sales, marketing, quality management, strategic planning, and new business development at Eastman Kodak, the Gartner Group, and Pitney Bowes. Quite, quite a nice, uh, rich resume and fits in perfectly with our activities here at SCORE. So John, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, as I said, I will be, uh, John will go till about quarter of one. 
then I'll take over the reins. We'll do the uh, chat, and then we will stop promptly at 1 o'clock. Um, so, uh, John, please uh, take it away. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so, sometimes I will have conversations with my clients about their financials. And sometimes the question comes up, well, how am I doing? Uh, how do I compare to other businesses? And those are all good questions. Uh, today's presentation is going to walk you through a tool that allows small businesses to compare their financial performance with those other businesses in the same industry. Um, so what I want to do first is to talk a little bit about the benchmark tool. This tool, by the way, is available in most libraries. You could go to the business library section and ask for this tool and look up your business and look at the financial performance of businesses in your industry. Um, I also want to cover what industries we've selected in this presentation. Obviously, I can't have all the businesses, but what, what I tried to do is to select businesses that are typical of clients that we have here at SCORE. Uh, I want to go over the financial metrics themselves. What are they? Why are they important? And then I want to start getting into the comparisons, uh, in uh, industry comparisons, in three key, are key areas. One, profitability, which is something we all mostly understand. Liquidity, that is the extent to which I have assets which I can make liquid into cash. And then finally, efficiency. How I how efficient am I able to um, move my business into a cash position? So um, let me go over, first of all, the tool itself. This is called the Risk Management Association Annual Statement Studies. It's a huge, thick book. Uh, it's data that the RMA collects anonymously from businesses. They send out a survey every year, and a certain number of businesses will fill out the survey. Uh, that forms the basis for the numbers in, in these studies. Um, the data indicates the financial performance of industries in the Department of Commerce NAICS listings. That's North American Industrial Commercial um, System. Um, it lists all the industries in the United States. Um, the data uh, is, is able to use a variety of financial benchmarks to indicate both best, average, and worst industry performance uh, in quartiles. So uh, it will give you the performance of the top 25% of the firms, the bottom 25% of the firms, and the middle 50%. Uh, I, have, I have not reviewed uh, the data for the worst firms. Um, just It would get us way into the data weeds, and I want to do that. But I, I will compare performances of the best businesses in those industries and those that I'll call average performance. One important point, um, the benchmarks, the data are guidelines. There may be very good reasons why your financial performance is not what it sh does not compare very well to those of other businesses. There could be strategic reasons where you're willing to uh, load a lot of debt in order to grow in the future. Uh, it could be that you're willing to take some, some uh, haircuts in profitability in order to compete more effectively. There may be a lot of reasons why your performance data may not measure up. So I don't want you to think this is, this is an all or nothing proposition, but it helps you understand where you sit with respect to your own business and how it compares to others. Um, the, here are the businesses that I've included in, 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 this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, the construction industry, and I've selected two areas of construction, one new housing construction and one commercial institutional uh, construction. A number of our clients uh, are in these two categories. Uh, for retail, I've selected baked goods and women's clothing. Well, by the way, I should point out that for construction, I've included revenue level levels from one to three million, three to five, five to ten. It goes up, by the way, to hundreds of millions of dollars, and usually that's, that's way more than our, our uh, small business clients are interested in finding out about. So I've selected those three revenue categories for construction. You'll see for retail and baked goods and women's clothing, I've selected revenue levels that are somewhat lower. 
one of the reasons for that is because construction tends to be large projects that tend to have large revenue amounts. And then finally, the, the, the last category is what I call professional services, which includes architects, graphics designers, management consultants, marketing agencies, and interior, design, uh, interior designers. And that's also at revenue levels between uh, 0 to 1, 1 to 3, and 3 to 5. So, so let's get ourselves uh, straight on what some of these financial statements look like and how they form the basis of the financial metrics that we're going to be reviewing today. This is an income statement. It happens to be uh, one of my clients. Uh, of course, I've changed all the names and all the basic data, but this is a real income statement. A couple things I should point out. First of all, this, this income statement uh, lists revenue at the top, cost of goods sold, and I'll get into what that means in a second. And, and to indicate then the difference between revenue and cost of goods sold is called the gross profit or gross margin. All other expenses are just that. Uh, these are expenses that can't be directly related to a particular transaction or to a particular customer experience. Uh, in the revenue section, my client has tried to segment these revenues by type of event. It could be by type of customer. It could be a lot of different ca uh, categories, but the key is not to have a big revenue number without understanding how you have various clients and segments that you're serving and how big they are how fast they're growing, and how profitable they are. The cost of goods sold are the costs of directly delivering a product or a service to your client. So in this case, it's the cost of food and the cost of kitchen labor. Uh, in retail, it, it, it's the cost of acquiring retail goods from a wholesaler or from a manufacturer, and the labor associated with uh, with delivering this. It could be shipping, um, but these are all costs that you can directly attribute to a customer transaction. Gross profit is important in two ways. First of all, it's the, base, it's, it's the first step in profitability. Uh, and we'll go over, by the way, profit, the profitability in these various industries, but if you don't have enough gross profit, you can't possibly be profitable. And you manage your costs, by the way, in gross profit differently than you do other expenses. If you start making uh, changes to your costs, acquiring a product from a different manufacturer, it could affect the quality, wh what you offer, and it could affect your customer satisfaction. Uh, the second important aspect of gross profit is it gives you an idea of how quickly you can cover the rest of your expenses. So in this case, 42 cents of every sales dollar goes to covering all other expenses, which includes rent, telephone, vehicle, um, uh, owners, ownership wages, uh, uh, accounts payable, any other kinds of expenses you can't directly attribute to a customer transaction. In this case, the gross profit is 42%. In, by industry standards, this is fairly typical in the catering business. However, in this case, the operating profit is not. It's just under 3%, and the reason for that is because the sales general administrative expenses are huge. They're almost 40% of all revenues. You can't have expenses of 40% and hope to make a profit. So that's the income statement. It's really a statement of business transactions, revenue and costs. And it's all, we'll also get into some of the metrics coming out of this income statement that compare one business to another. The next is the balance sheet. Uh, this is a statement, and by the way, it's laid out pretty much as it, all, it usually is. On the left-hand side are assets, and these are divided between current assets and fixed assets. Current assets are those that have a life of 12 months or less, and they include things like cash, accounts receivable, and inventory. Uh, fixed assets are those that have a life of greater than one year, and it's, it could be physical, uh, uh, physical equipment like computers, furniture, equipment, cars, it could be real estate, whatever fixed assets that have a life of more than 12 months. Um, 
And by the way, as as your uh, as your fixed assets, uh, the value of your fixed assets will decline over time because there's such a thing called depreciation. Depreciation is the use of a fixed asset over its uh, typical life. In the case of computers, it's about three years. In the case of office furniture, it could be 15 years. But whatever the useful life of that equipment is, every for every year, a certain percentage of that asset declines because you've used it. And you can see then that accumulated depreciation appears on the balance sheet and reduces the net fixed asset value. On the right-hand side, there's liabilities and stockholders' equity. And liabilities are divided pretty much the way assets were, between current and long-term. And current liabilities are those liabilities that have a life of less than 12 months, and long-term liabilities having a life of more than 12 months. Um, the, the two sides compare to be equal, which is to say, by definition, liabilities plus net worth equals fixed assets. And we'll get into the significance of this soon when, when we talk more about the financial metrics. So that's the balance sheet. It's a statement of what you own or what you owe to run the business. You can't run a business without assets. And these assets then contribute to your revenue and to your profitability. And the final one is the cash flow statement. This is really a kind of checkbook more than anything else. So you start with the beginning cash balance. Uh, in this case, it's $15,000. You have inflows coming from sales and accounts receivable. You have outflows, which is uh, all, the co all the things that you pay for. And you have then the net cash flow. In this case, for the month of January, you had, uh, uh, you had less cash coming in and more cash going out for a negative cash flow of $24,500. Um, this compares then to the beginning cash balance of 15, so you have an operating cash balance of $9,300,000. That money has to come from somewhere. It could be from Aunt Tilly, it could be from your bank on a line of credit, it could be uh, whatever, but this tells you that you have a negative cash balance for that month. And that carries forward into the subsequent month, of February, March. And you'll notice, by the way, that finally in April, we have a ending cash balance that's positive. Now, I should make this point. The difference between the cash flow statement and the income statement has to do with when we recognize revenue and costs. Um, in, in this case, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, income statement is, is done on an accrual basis, which is to say... I recognize the revenues when I make the sale or when I send the invoice out, not when I get the cash. I recognize the, the costs when I acquire the item that I bought, not when I pay for it. So that's the difference between the income statement on the one hand and the cash flow statement on the other. Some small businesses run their business on a cash accounting basis. This is not something I recommend because you don't understand the operational characteristics of your business if you don't know when you made a sale and you don't know when you bought something. So those are the three basic financial statements that form the basis for this analysis. And they work together pretty much the way that the, the uh, diagram depicts. In other words, I have assets that generate sales, I have inventory, I have computer equipment, whatever. Whatever it is, they generate sales, and then these sales uh, I can eat, uh, I get immediate cash from, or I get later cash from. Immediate cash goes directly to uh, the the uh, cash flow statement. Uncollected sales go into the uh, into the um, balance sheet as accounts receivable. Expenses that generate liabilities go into the li uh, short term liability section. If I'm going to reduce debt, that goes into into the cash flow statement by uh, by reducing the amount of debt I owe. Uh, so all of these three statements work together uh, to give you a much full, fuller picture of the financial capability of your business. Okay, so given these three statements, what are some of the key questions that this analysis helps us understand? First of all, what are the industry profitability levels? Are profitability levels different for the construction business than they are from retail? Turns out they are, but what are they? And are my profitability levels 
good or bad compared to the rest of my fellow uh, businesses? What percentage of assets are tied up in cash, receivables, fixed assets, and inventory? That becomes important because to the extent that you've got assets tied up in non-cash, that prevents you from achieving the kind of cash flow management that you're looking for. How does my long-term debt compare to net worth? Uh, we'll I'll give you more examples of that. But if I have lots and lots of long-term debt, uh, the way the balance sheet works is that's going to take away from my net worth. Uh, th that is a negative. And the idea is I want to try to reduce long-term debt in order to improve my profitability. How well does EBIT cover debt interest payment? B EBIT, by the way, is, is an acronym standing for Earnings Before Interest and Taxes. It's your operating profit. And if my EBIT doesn't cover my interest payments, I have a big problem. Or if my EBIT uh, covers my interest payments but I don't ha have a lot left over, that's also a problem. And how does that compare industry to industry? How effective are my assets in generating sales? If I have lots and lots of assets and they're not gener generating much sales, I either have a sales problem or I have uh, too many assets that I have to start getting rid of. What are the industry working capital levels? This is really a difference between my short-term assets and my short-term liabilities. It's the term of art is called working capital. The bigger gap I have between my short-term assets and liability is it, it's protecting me against financial risk. If I lose a customer, for instance, and I have good working capital levels, I can afford to lose that customer. I mean, I don't want to, but I can afford it. Uh, if I have much narrow difference between uh, my working capital, I may have a vendor who will come and demand payment, in which case I'm suddenly in a negative position, and that's a financial risk I don't want to face. And then finally, what's a good or mediocre industry financial performance? Given the top 25%, how does that compare to the medium 50%? All these are key questions that we're going to be asking in this presentation. Um, so, and here are the metrics. Profitability, we've talked a little bit about this. Liquidity, uh, this, that's basically uh, working capital, comparing my, uh, my current, uh, my, my, my working capital levels, short-term assets versus uh, short-term liabilities. And then finally, efficiency. How efficient am I in turning non-cash assets into cash? Mm -hmm. And here's the first one. I'm sorry for this. There's a lot of data here, but I'm, I'm going to give you some highlights in the next slide. When we look at the construction industry, we're looking at lower gross profits. In new home construction, those gross profits are between 16 and 20 percent. Remember, in my, in my catering example, gross profits were 40 percent, which was typical. In this case, construction industry, because of its uh, very large project size, people can afford to have more competitive lower gross profits because the gross profit dollars are much larger than a typical transaction. In this case, new home construction, they have lower uh, uh, gross profits, uh, but the EBIT is similar to the commercial industrial. In the commercial industrial, they have higher gross profits, probably because they, because they are in the commercial industrial industry, they are able to use their, uh, their operating capability more efficient than new home construction which tend to be smaller businesses with individual home uh, projects as opposed to commercial industrial that may have many set of projects and be able to use their operating capability more efficiently. Uh, in asset utilization, new homes, very high inventory levels compared to the commercial industrial, which has low inventory levels. Now, I'd have to guess a little bit here, but I suspect that new home construction needs to have a lot of on-hand inventory to, 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 to do these jobs, where in effect, commercial and institutional uh, construction may be able to have what I call just-in-time inventory management, where they order the inventory the day before or the week before they need it, and therefore their inventory levels are lower. On the other hand, uh, on home, new home construction, their accounts receivable levels are low. Um, compared to the accounts receivable levels uh, in commercial institutional, which, is, which are high. Why is that? I suspect because in new home construction, uh, it's relatively easy to get payment quickly. You, you, you might get it from a bank 
that has the cash. You might get it from the homeowner that is able to, to do the transaction right then and there. You're not waiting. Commercial institutional, however, has to work with larger organizations that may have their own requirements about how fast they pay uh, their construction companies. Day sales outstanding is a measure of how quickly you're able to convert your accounts receivable into cash. In new homes, they do it quickly. In uh, commercial and institutional, they don't, in part because they're dealing with companies that may have requirements about how quickly they pay off their, uh, their liabilities. Uh, debt interest co coverage in new homes, uh, it's, it's great. They are able to, with their EBIT, they're able to cover their loans, in part, I suspect, because they don't have huge amount of long-term debt. Um, however, in this case, there's a big difference between the top performers and the average performance. In this case, um, uh, in the construction industry, where it's all about cash management, those businesses that manage their cash well in this, in this industry do well. Uh, working capital, the current ratio is good. 2.7, 2.8 is considered to be a solid uh, working capital uh, uh, difference. In other words, uh, you have 2.7 times the short-term assets than you do short-term liabilities. But this reduces significantly to the average performer, down to the point where it's almost at risk for a, 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 for a, a financial surprise. Um, sales to total assets, good. Good for both, uh, really, uh, home and commercial institutional. Big fall off, fall, fall off, however, when you move from the best to the average. And then finally, EBIT to net worth. This is the rate of return. Again, this, this uh, a well-run construction company does w pretty well. An average-run construction, construction company doesn't do so well. So the takeaways for construction, uh, low operating margins make operational cost control critical. And the larger the job, the larger the gross margin dollar, the more headroom there is for your management of profitability. Um, a lots of uh, assets are tied up in either inventory or accounts receivable. Mm -hmm. This is a challenge when it comes to converting these non-cash assets into cash. And the better ones do it better, more quickly, than the, the average ones. Cash management is the key to success, as we point out. And the return on investment is really average to poor. You don't find a lot of equity funds investing in construction companies. That's not to say that people in the construction business don't want to be there or can't be profitable. It's just that the average net worth is lower. They, they get the value out of operating margins. They get the value out of cash management, but not necessarily increases in net worth. So that's the construction industry. Retail industry, baked goods versus women's clothing. Uh, in this case, you'll notice the profitability is much better than in construction. In baked goods, it's, uh, it's higher than it is for women's clothing. The reason for that is because, to some extent, it, the baked goods industry makes their own bread, or they make their own cookies, and they can, they can have, uh, they have some control over their operating costs. In women's clothing, typically, uh, the retailers don't make the stuff, they don't sew the stuff, they buy it from a manufacturer or they buy it from a wholesaler, and therefore they have relatively little control over their cost of goods sold. So their profitability, while better than construction, baked goods enjoy the higher gross margin than does women's clothing. In, in asset utilization, the baked goods industry have a very high percentage of their assets as fixed. You can imagine, by the way, why this might be. They have a storefront. They have ovens. They have refrigerators. They have uh, display cases. They have a lot of stuff that's going to require some initial investment in fixed assets. Um, women's clothing, less so, but there they have relatively high inventory levels. Why? Because they've got to make sure that inventory is there for the sale. If it's not there, they don't make the sale. Um, in liability mix, as you can imagine, for baked goods, long-term debt levels are high, uh, which impacts net worth. Why? Because there's a significant amount of fixed asset investment required for this business. In women's clothing, uh, the, the long-term debt levels are high initially for lower revenue businesses, but 
they quickly rebound at higher revenue levels. So the key for this business is to make sure that you get your revenue levels above a million bucks or so uh, compared to other in businesses in this industry. And to the extent that they're under a million bucks, you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. Day sales outstanding is not an issue. It's typically a cash business. Um, debt interest coverage um, is, in this case, not nearly as good as construction, so that, and for baked goods, $2.5 of EBIT covers $1 of interest, um, which is, th that's by the way, uh, th that's a dollar of covering interest that doesn't go to your EBIT. It's elsewhere. Uh, in the case of women's clothing, it's even worse. $1.2 of EBIT covers $1 of interest payments, but at higher revenue levels, this debt coverage improves significantly. Uh, working capital is good for the best performers in both baked goods and women's clothing, but in, in, in average performance, the, the ratio of, of um, uh, fixed, fixed uh, short-term assets to short-term liabilities is dangerously close to being insolvent. Um, again, the, the, the key question here is cash management. And the key question here is growth to the point where you now are operating at greater efficiency levels. Sales at total assets are, is good uh, at the, among the best performers, uh, not nearly as good as construction, but still good. And average performers, uh, their, their assets don't generate the kind of revenue they should. And then finally, EBIT, the net worth, um, if the best is good, the average is uh, marginal. Um, so that's the uh, retail industry, and the takeaways there, gross profits are in the 50% range for the most part because of predictable direct costs of materials and labor. You don't necessarily, most retail operations don't control their cost of goods sold because they get the stuff from elsewhere. The difference, of course, is those retail businesses that do their own manufacturing, if you will, baking and cooking and whatnot. Um, bakery and women's clothing businesses under $1 million in revenues require relatively large amounts of fixed assets or inventories, negatively impacting profitability and cash management. It's that $1 million ceiling that many businesses need to get beyond. Uh, working capital levels uh, are dangerously tight for businesses under $1 million in revenues um, and for average performers. Uh, asset revenue productivity is low. In other words, my assets don't generate as much revenue as does construction. Um, it may not be that important in this case, uh, but, but clearly cash management is yet another key indicator of success in this business. Once established revenue levels exceed a million bucks, the probability of profitability increases, as does the return on investment. Now, again, these are general statements. Uh, you may have a, a retail business under $1 million and doing just fine. But uh, that tends to be an important milestone for how you generate or how you measure your success. Uh, design professionals industries. These I've, I've included here architects and interior designers. Uh, interesting enough here, the EBIT for architects declines as revenue levels increase, probably because volume increases require hopper, uh, higher operating costs. If I'm doing a project, and then another project, another project. I can probably do it myself. I don't have to worry about uh, 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 CAD CAM. I don't have to worry about designers. I don't have to worry about uh, uh, engineering technical capability. I can do it all myself. As I increase the number of jobs, I need to increase the operating costs associated with those. Um, and that's true, by the way, for both architects and interior designers. Uh, asset utilization. High fixed asset amounts and low revenue levels, but this ratio declines at higher levels. Um, again, uh, you have architects, most architects require an office. Why? Because their clients expect an office. They don't expect a garage. They don't expect a basement. They expect an architect who looks like they're successful, and these are going to require office and furniture and equipment and other kinds of tools and there's a certain amount of minimum revenue required to cover a lot of these costs. For the interior designers, um, the mix of, of assets don't really change over time. And the reason for that is because many designers work out of their homes. 
it's typical. They don't have uh, a storefront. They don't need a storefront. And so, and, and they have the capability as they grow to add capacity without adding assets. Um, liability mix, um, high current liabilities for architects, um, but as, as, uh, as they increase the revenue, that liability uh, uh, mix goes down. Um, Long-term debt levels for interior designers are relatively low. Again, their, their, their investment requirements are not as great as for architects. Um, day sales outstanding. The, um, so the receivables are reasonable for architects, although as their business increases, that day sales outstanding, that is the, the number of days it takes to, to, uh, to convert receivables into cash increases. And the reason for that is probably because they are, these architects are, have more commercial institutional customers who have payment uh, terms that demand, or I should say that requires the architects to accept longer uh, DSO, longer uh, days uh, outstanding. Um, for interior designers, uh, the day sales outstanding uh, does uh, increase, but not at, at at unreasonable levels. The benchmark that you want to try to, to target is a day sales outstanding, that is the number of days it takes to convert cash to receivables of 30. If you're 30 and under, you're probably doing pretty well. Um, among top performance, EBIT easily covers interest payments, but among average performance, that advantage decreases significantly by a factor of seven. Uh, working capital is good for the best, both for um, architects and interior designers. But again, for the average performer, much like the retail business, that advantage quickly goes away and you have now a ratio that is close to being uh, in a financially risky position. Sales to total assets is good for the best, uh, not so good for the average. And then EBIT to net worth is pretty good for the best, both architects and interior designers not particularly good, although not terrible, for the average performer. Um, so bottom line, um, architects, both architects and interior designers have difficulty in maintaining profitability as revenues increase, indicating problems in managing scale. So the more business you've got, the more costs you've got, uh, the better you have to manage your operating costs, and the, the more carefully you have to manage your cash. Architects have higher fixed asset requirements at lower revenue levels, but those, th that efficiency increases as, as revenue increases. Interior designers seem to have little change in their asset mix over time, and I think we've talked about reasons for that. Um, architects have more working capital pressure largely as a result of higher than typical short-term liabilities. Now, uh, in, in many cases, architects may want to employ engineers they may want to take an entire job and they have all sorts of contracting costs associated with that. And as a result, their short-term liabilities are higher, uh, requiring a, 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 a tighter watch over working capital. The best performers do well at this. The average performers don't. Architects have higher access to total sales than interior designers, probably because of higher project fees. Uh, an architectural project is going to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Interior design might be 10 or 15 or 20,000. Both the best performing architects and interior designers have excellent returns on invested capital, increases of 14%. And then uh, marketing professionals, uh, and I've divided these between marketing agencies on the one hand and graphic designers on the other. EBIT is good for marketing agencies but drops off significant, significant at the three to five rev million revenue level, indicating capacity management is an issue. Um, as, your, as, as your jobs go up, you suddenly have difficulty in managing all of the capability you need to add and do it efficiently. Um, for graphics designers, uh, EBIT remains consistently good at all revenue levels. Uh, asset utilization, high fixed asset amounts in for marketing agencies, but this ratio declines at higher levels while receivables increase. 
again, for lots of the same reasons that we cited for um, for uh, uh, the um, uh, for retail and for uh, the um, No, um, sorry, I'm losing myself here. Yeah, the, the, the design professionals. Um, so um, liability mix, uh, high current liabilities, high long-term debt, at lower revenue levels resulting in negative net worth. This was for the, the lower performers, marketing agencies almost uniformly were negative net worth in revenue levels of a million dollars or less. Um, as they get above a million dollars, this negativity goes away and profitability increases. Day sales outstanding, reasonably low at 20 days. Uh, graphic designers, reasonably low at 30 days. Um, debt interest coverage, big difference between top and average performers in covering debt interest in marketing agencies. The same with graphic designers. The key here is, again, revenue growth that solves a lot of financial problems. Working capital is pretty good. Uh, it's uh, for the average performer. It's it's just at the acceptable level, but it's at a, at a level that uh, that could go south with a, a narrower difference between short-term assets and short-term liabilities. Sales to total assets. Marketing agencies hit the ball out of the park on this one. Eleven to one. Very very efficient use of of. Um, uh, uh, assets it generate revenue at, among the best, and pretty good for the average performer. The same it cannot be said for the graphics designer. While five to one is okay, the average performer in graphic designers one point five to one, not all that great use of assets. And then finally, EBITDA net worth, pretty good for the best performer. Again, the difference here, as we've seen in other examples, the difference here is that the high performers who are attending to things like asset mix and liability mix and net worth and debt coverage and all that other stuff, they do a much better job and have much better financial performance than the average performers. That's the key to their success. Uh, marketing professionals industry, despite good operating margins, high startup costs and inefficiencies of low revenue levels produce negative net worth for both marketing agencies and graphics designers. There also seems, at least in terms of the data that I've seen from uh, the, R the uh, RMA, there seems to be some kind of operational wall at revenue levels of three to five million dollars that significantly reduces EBIT for marketing agencies. Um, I suspect, uh, so marketing agencies are heavy in labor and it may be a, a, a function of just not being able to utilize the additional label, labor in efficient ways because many owners of marketing agencies are marketers. They're not necessarily business operations people. Uh, for both marketing agencies and graphic design firms, there's a big difference between the best and average performers in working capital and interest debt coverage. And the difference is most notable in comparing the return on investment for top performers and the average performance. And the last example comes uh, from the management consulting industry. Here, almost all the financial metrics are good, good to enviable. So EBIT is very, very good at low to mid levels of revenues. It declines at highest level, but still acceptable. And we're talking about, by, by the way, about a profitability of much larger revenue numbers and therefore much larger margin dollars that you'll enjoy. Uh, fixed asset requirements are relatively mo modest. There's the consultant. There's maybe an information service. Maybe he hires another consultant on a contracting basis, but only when they need it. Uh, so fixed asset requirements are not very high. Long-term um, liability, uh, the long-term debt declines from 20 uh, to 10%. And net worth correspondingly increases 20 to 40 percent. These, by the way, are numbers you don't see in any other industry. You don't see uh, 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 liability levels of 10 percent and net worth levels of 40 percent. Uh, day sales outstanding is excellent. Three days among the best performance. 30 days among average performers. Debt interest coverage is excellent. Working capital is excellent. Sales to total asset is excellent. EBIT is excellent. 
And there's got to be something institutional about this that would explain why these numbers are so good. I'm going to try to give you my idea of why that is. Um, of all the industries we've reviewed in this presentation, service this industry, management consulting, is financially the healthiest in almost every category. But the success of this industry, in my view, is probably because there are a variety of niche suppliers offering such things as supply chain management for manufacturers or um, service uh, equipment service efficiency or growth plans for the financial services industry or whatever. There's a number of niche suppliers, and they have found a niche that they serve very well and for which there is not a lot of competitors, in part because these management businesses have unique intellectual property or know-how that can't be easily duplicated. So that is the, uh, that's the analysis, and now I will entertain questions. Okay, John, thank you very much. This is Steve Smith again. And we do have some uh, good questions here uh, for you. And by the way, thank you for that presentation. Having been a management consultant myself, I never realized uh, why I was having so much fun. Now I, now I do. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me start with these questions, and I'm going to kind of go in the order that they came in. Um, there's a question here from Janice Brady on bad debt, and uh, it says, uh, could you touch on bad debt descriptions? I think probably at what are examples of bad debts, or what, when you talk about that, um, and what do you need to be aware of there, worry about? Now, are you, are you, are you talking about uh, debt that a company owes to its supplier? Or are you talking about debt that the customers owe to the service? I'm going to assume until she t says differently that it's receivable. Oh, okay. Risk. Yeah. So every business has some percentage of receivables that they believe are uncollectible by experience, by just by, by the, their, own, uh, their own experience. In Many cases, that number can be 5 to 10 percent. Uh, if it gets much above 10 percent, you've got a bunch of customers you don't want anymore. But there is some, uh, every, res every receivable dollar has some risk of never being paid. And you've got to be very careful about how you manage that relationship. Uh, you don't necessarily want to be uh, uh, a, a wolf after accounts receivable if that means losing a very valuable customer. So you have to make some decisions, business decisions, about what debt you want to collect now, what debt you want to collect later, and what debt you're willing to, to accept as never being collectible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Okay, and then she came back and said customers owe the company. Yeah, so that's, yeah. What, yeah. that's what we did. Okay, good. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we've done the, we did this uh, webinar before one time and got this question before. So it's, um, it's from... Uh, Venkat, who I believe is a client of yours, <clears throat> asking, is the, rich, is the Risk Management Association annual statement available online? No, not that I know of. Uh, it, it's a huge book. It's a significant uh, price. I think the RMA reference guide is in the seven or $800 uh, uh, range. It might be available online. Uh, I just find it really convenient to go to a library and look at it for free. Okay, that's consistent with the last time the way you answered that question, so that must be true. Okay, so we have now a question. Um, it, it's, a, it's fairly complicated. So it, it, it's from um, Myrvet Bookwart, and it's this. Do you prepare all three financial statements before starting a business, i.e. Uh, opening a bakery? How crucial are the statements before going ahead with the investments? Good question. Do you make estimations on costs and revenues if unfamiliar with the industry? Yes. That's a really and good question. That, and and by, by the way, that's an exercise that you can do for free. Uh, it doesn't cost you a penny. All you have to do is recreate what you think a reasonable income statement would look like. What do I expect in terms of revenues in the first year and what's the ramp up rate? What are my estimated cost of goods sold? What are my other expenses? And what do I estimate my profitability to, to be? What assets do I require? Uh, do I need to 
buy some property? Do I need to rent a building? Do I need to buy an oven? What are they? And how? To, and, and, and given the costs associated with that before I ever open my doors, what's the risk of my being able to grow my revenue levels to the point where I can cover the cost of those assets? Those are exercises that you can do. By the way, you can do that with a score volunteer. Uh, I typically will put together what I call forecasts for both income statements and for uh, balance sheets. And you can do that by asking uh, several questions, doing a little research at libraries, uh, may maybe even going into stores to check out prices. It's, it's an essential exercise and one that, that can save you a lot of time and a lot of money if you do it. And you may decide after doing it, the risks are too high. I am not getting into the baked goods business. All right. Okay, good. Great. Um, let's see here. Now we have another one uh, that's also relatively complicated, so I'm just going to take it slowly here. Um, it's from John Moody. Is the drop in gross margin as the service businesses grow reflecting the move from just the owner being the service provider to having to hire or use contractors to deliver higher work volumes? Which of, which of those two or something else? Yeah, no, it, 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 that's true. That, that's what happens. In m most service businesses, they start out with an owner that's delivering the service, whatever it is. And an owner can do this by him or herself without any extra costs or with moderate costs. On the other hand, uh, that owner has a certain capacity, and I'll just say maybe it's a project a month or a project a week, and if they want to grow beyond that point, and you'll notice, by the way, that in some businesses it's important that you get above a certain revenue level. If you want to grow to that point, now you've got to hi start hiring contractors. Mm -hmm. Or now you have to start offering services that you, you didn't have to offer before. So your operating costs are going to go up as your revenue levels and capacity demands go up as well. And then there's a kind of a corollary question he's embedded here, which is how do the owners account for their own time? Yeah, um, I usually recommend that the owners assign some cost to their time. It's not free. <laughs> You're in this for, to make money. The question is, what are your gross profits, and how do they compare to other businesses? And if you're not assigning yourself a value of whatever it is, you, have no, you are uh, improperly reflecting your gross profits. That's number one. And you need to understand what your basic gross profit picture looks like. Number two, if you want to sell your business, you have to account for your time. Because whoever wants to buy the business needs to understand what the basic profitability uh, of that is going to be. And they're going to want to get some return on their time just as you want on yours. So I usually recommend don't assign yourself a dollar an hour. Do something reasonable within the industry. And a typical service provider, professional service provider, is probably going to be charging in the range of $100 to $200 an hour, depending upon the type of service that they're in. So assign yourself that. Yeah. Right? And I think, Janice, that may get to your um, second question as well that you asked just, just one second ago. If, if not, let me know. In the meantime, I'm going to go back to Stu Cole's question. Um, you hear a lot about EBITA, EBITA, EBITDA, and we didn't talk about that here. We talked about EBIT. Uh, is that is EBITA something that we need to worry about, and why or why not? Uh, it, it, it really depends on the industry. It, it, EBITDA, by the way, E-B-I-T-D-A, and the D stands for depreciation, and the A stands for amortization. Uh, it, it, depreciation amortization is a non-cash cost. Remember now, we, we've just assigned a certain value or assets, and we've assigned that as a cost in the income statement, but it's non-cash. Uh, the question is, is that if you want to look at EBITDA non-cash as a way to measure your performance? In some industries, it's important. In other industries, it's not. Particularly, it's important in heavy fixed asset industries mm -hmm. where uh, the depreciation is a significant part of it, and you don't necessarily want to confuse your profitability with a large fixed asset base. All right. Good. Got it. I, I, learned, that. I learned something, too. Um, so let, let's see. We're, uh, we're at just about at the top of the hour here, but we do have uh, a few minutes left if there are any other questions. If not, I'll do a little mark screen.
poor marketing of my own here. Okay, so if you have any other questions, please put them in the, in the chat room. There have been some good questions, I thought. Um, let me uh, just remind you that we are going to two webinars per month, uh, effective today, actually. The next one is October 11th, and as I indicated before, the topic is legal issues on, of social media with Cliff Enico um, supplying the expertise. Um, the, I also said earlier, and this is important because we've had some problems the last couple months getting all of our past webinars uh, up on the SCORE, fairfieldcounty.org site. So I just want to remind you, as I said before, that all of our 2016 uh, webinars are now available at the site, and here's how you get to them. And once you're at scorefairfieldcounty.org, score uh, you click on, at the top there will see a tab called Workshops, you click on it. It will open up all of our workshops, uh, both face-to-face, -face, as I indicated before, usually in libraries, and the webinars. If you go to the lower left-hand corner of that page, you'll see a heading called About Score Fairfield. Now, I know that's not the most logical place to put this, and we're, I'm, I'm working on that, <laughs> so give me some more time on that. But you go to the lower left, you'll see About Score Fairfield County, About Score Fairfield, actually, and below that, Online Workshops. And when you click on that, you will go to the list of the 2016 Online Workshops, and you'll have an opportunity to pick and choose uh, and access them easily and uh, they're, you know, interesting, very interesting. A lot on IT trends, um, marketing uh, to uh, your, your customers in the most efficient manner. Uh, crowdfunding was another one that comes to mind quickly here. And uh, so try to do that because I think you'll, you'll find that um, there's a lot of intellectual capital there that we need to put, tap into. And I think John has uh, something to add here. Yeah, just, just one statement on the uh, Risk Management Association statement studies. Um, I, I tried to make the uh, information from that reference guide understandable. Uh, it, it may be a little confounding for those of you who first uh, look at it. I think the best thing, and by the way, with a little patience, you can read through the guide and understand what the metrics mean and what, what, the, what the ratios mean. But uh, on the other hand, I have, I have clients who will take their industry, photocopy a relevant page from the guide, and we can walk through it. It's easy enough to give you an idea of how you can use that information in the most effective way. Okay, great. Hey, listen, we're gonna, uh, gonna shut down the webinar now. It's been a good, uh, good session. I uh, hope you all learned a lot. And, uh, Again, visit scorefairfieldcounty.org uh, to get our full line of services. We look forward to doing business with you uh, more. And remember, the next webinar is October the 11th with the famous Cliff Enico. So thank you very much for joining, and have a very good day. Goodbye.